Batman Arkham City does what game sequels should do. It expands on what worked in the first game while experimenting with some new ideas around the edges. Just like its predecessor, I played it at release and really enjoyed my time with it. So it's time to ask the question, is it a classic? What are you waiting for? The signal! Batman Arkham Asylum was a great critical and audience success. And an objective classic according to me. So a sequel was certain to happen, especially since you could consider Arkham Asylum to have functioned as a super elaborate testing ground for gameplay mechanics and the overall game engine. So without a lot of new work needing to be done on the tech part of things, this means the sequel could greatly expand its scope and story. The game starts off with... Catwoman, which is fairly bold for a game whose title starts with Batman, but I'll allow it. Because I think it was a good idea to start it off with one of its main new features, a Catwoman focused subplot. Rest assured, it switches quickly to Batman after that intro. Overall, Arkham City plays like Arkham Asylum with some minor changes here and there. Combat is still the same Bat Dance Dance Revolution button mashing endeavor, however, if you really want to focus on using it and time things properly, it can get ridiculously cool and comboplex. That being said, if you don't wish or have the twitch reflexes anymore to do that, the guanotan amount of bad gadgets you can now use in combat will make for considerably more fun, tactical and dare I say less repetitive combat encounters overall. The mosh pit fights will generally still be a blur of clicking and double pressing space, but that is to be expected. Funny thing about the game, when I installed it, I got a direct X window prompt to install, which was really super throwback for me because it made me realize I haven't had to install or update DirectX in eons basically. This time around, you get access to a larger number of bad gadgets, with some very cool new entries such as the freeze grenade you get from Mr. Freeze. We'll talk about him later. Likewise, you have a larger array of upgrades you can buy with your levels and not only for Batman. Catwoman has a reduced number of upgrades available to her as well. The thugs still have issues with hearing and seeing stuff in their near vicinity, but this kinda has to be this way in order to allow for the stealth approach and the cramped environments to exist. The bad stealth approach has always appealed to me from a headcanon perspective. My version of Batman is much more of a ninja type than the Bruiser from The Dark Knight Returns, let's say. I love the comic and animation for completely different reasons. Even though there are cramped areas in this game, Arkham City allows for much more freedom of movement when on the outside than Asylum did, because there's literally way more space. Playing as Catwoman or Robin is similar to Batman, but not identical. Catwoman's bad grapple equivalent, for instance, is a timed mechanic, which you have to get just right for maximum points and skill challenges. She seems to also be more agile than Batman, moving faster when fighting, but that could also just be my impression. Robin, who gets introduced as a playable character in the Harley Quinn's Revenge DLC, more on that later as well, has a pared down number of gadgets, but introduces the bullet shield and fighting with a metal pole. And I have to say, the sounds of you beating the fuck out of enemies with a glorified piece of rebar are very satisfying. We really need to talk about the music here. The soundtrack has a grandiose and epic quality to it, truly cinematic in my opinion. I could easily see myself scoring a Batman movie with it, no problem. The main theme especially takes you through several emotions and never fails to give me goosebumps when the violin starts soaring at around 1 minute 58. Seeing as how the nuts and bolts of the game aren't that different from the previous one, what I want to focus on instead is how the game does everything else. Meaning scope, environment, story and characters. Arkham City is a much larger game than Asylum. A considerably more open world if you may. 
It took what Asylum did and raised it several notches in terms of sheer real estate, verticality and diversity of environments. While the story will generally keep you to the insides of buildings, so as to make it more challenging to deal with the increasingly better armed and armored thugs, the outside is always perfectly accessible and approachable from various angles. Whether you like to glide into places and kick enemies for a splashy entrance, or grapple your way up buildings and then hold yourself precariously on ledges till you can get behind the patrolling enemies and silently take them down. There are also a couple of times in the game when things happen in some form of ethereal plane, such as during the Blood of the Demon event and the Mad Hatter encounter. So there's quite some thematic visual diversity during the storyline as well, a part of it taking place in an old underground part of the city called Wonder City, for instance, a sort of World's Fair type of exposition from the Victorian era. This is where the League of Assassins hangs out. And I think it might be an homage to the Batman 66 TV show because a lot of those episodes tended to take place in abandoned World's Fair expos. <laughs> When we talk about story and characters, there is one name in particular that I need to focus on, and that is Paul Dini, the main writer for both Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. Now, depending on your level of bad fandom, you may not really know who Paul Dini is. He's been writing for animations and comics since the mid 80s, having a hand in lots of nostalgic titles like He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, Gem or Dungeons and Dragons. But what is most relevant for us is what he wrote between 1992 and 1995, because Paul Dini was one of the main writers for none other than Batman the Animated Series. And that would be pretty cool in and of itself, but he didn't stop there. He continued to then write for a slew of DC related animated properties from that point onward. But this video isn't about his career. This is about only one episode he wrote for Batman the Animated Series because Paul Dini is the guy who wrote Motherfucking Heart of Ice, the episode generally considered to be the best of the entire show. Heart of Ice is where we get introduced to the character of Victor Freeze. That's Mr. Freeze to you. Mr. Freeze, a cryogenic scientist who was using his company's tech to cryogenically preserve his terminally ill wife, Nora. His boss finds out about this misappropriation of funds and pushes Victor into a mixture of cryochemicals, which alters his body so he cannot live outside of a sub-zero environment. Driven by the need for revenge and, I'd say, justice. Against the man who caused his chilling condition and killed his Nora, Mr. Freeze engages in some ice shenanigans and gets dispatched by Batman thanks to a weapon provided to him by Alfred. You'll need this. Knockout gas. Chicken soup. The only way to fight a cold. I quickly recapped Heart of Ice because this origin story is heavily implied in Arkham City, and it would make sense for it to be so since they're both written by the same guy. This also means that Arkham City's Mr. Freeze is a more complex character, a continuation of the deeply tragic one from the show, with the important mention that in the Arkham universe, Nora is not dead. She is still safely preserved in her cryogenic enclosure which you save from some of Joker's henchmen. Ah, the Joker. He is one of the main villains of the story. There are three in total. There's him, Strange and Ra's al Ghul. But he is quite possibly the least interesting of all of them, despite eating up more story space than the other two. I may be biased, I have a fair bit of Joker fatigue considering the large number of times he has been seen in mainstream bad media. And I believe that there are several other villains that deserve way more attention than they've historically received. Likewise, situating him in a cornered position brings out the severe narrative limitations of his character. A character who has no skin in the game, who has nothing to live for but to create chaos is super boring when you put a ticking clock on him without spoiling anything for anyone out there who still hasn't played it. The three main villain parallel plot lines intertwine and integrate very well within the overall storyline of the game, and the secondary villains such as the Penguin, Mr. Freeze and Harley Quinn further integrate within the web of intersetting plot threads. Story cutscenes are really well made and work to keep the story flowing. The beginning is a bit cutscene heavy. But that being said, they don't outstay their welcome or overplay their hand. They add to the proceedings and allow the story to progress at a nice clip. 
There are a few special mentions I need to make relating to the characters and the story. The penguin's Australian question mark accent is still an odd choice, however not necessarily a bad one. His obsession with collecting things is a new addition to his character that actually gives him a bit more personality. There's this one moment when Alfred is a certified boss, acting as Bruce's anchor to humanity, putting Batman in his place when he's considering saving Talia as opposed to doing what Batman should do. Batman must save Gotham. Then there's also a moment of tenderness in Crime Alley, which is very cinematic and all it lacks is a scene of seeing a gun flash and Pearl hitting the ground to put it over the top. Thankfully, it doesn't do that. Instead, it offers an introspective respite from the action and violence of the game. As you go through the story, the world of Arkham City is populated with quite a few side quests that open up to you, which you can engage in at your own leisure. With one exception, you can do it during or after you finish the story quests. And these are more than the Riddler trophies. He has also taken hostages, which you have to first find and release from some other puzzle like deadly traps. It's very character appropriate and even also works within the game world. However, due to my well documented history of hating lever puzzles, I'm not a big fan. The Mad Hatter is the only villain who has just one standalone encounter with you, but it's a pretty psychedelic one that definitely stands out, just like your Donnie Darko-like mask during it. The others, Bane, Zass and Deadshot have longer running quests, but you dispatch them fairly quickly. And there are a couple of other mysteries and things you can engage in during your stay in Arkham City. Also, I totally forgot Clayface was not only in this game, but its final boss. As per usual, the boss fights were very forgettable. It's a bit of an issue with these games because you could just not have them and it would still be just as good, so basically they don't matter. Moving on to the Harley Quinn's Revenge DLC, I must mention that Paul Dini was not invited back to write for it, which is quite the odd choice considering how well written the base game is. And here's my speculation as to why. It might have been due to what he wanted to do with Harley Quinn's character. In the base game, you will find this fairly frightening scene at a certain point. A positive pregnancy test heavily implying that she is pregnant with Joker's child. Which I don't know about you, but is terrifying both from a story perspective as well from a character development one. However, in the DLC, you find this very different situation where it is made abundantly clear that she is in fact not pregnant. That looks like a mid-run retcon if I've ever seen one, but again, that's just my speculation. Otherwise, the DLC adds Robin as a playable character and he comes with his separate gadgets and otherwise there is a quick add-on story to continue the events of the main game. Things that need mentioning here is that Harley Quinn's morning costume is way cooler than her base one and that her henchmen have way cooler costumes and makeup than Jokers do. Also, she's a much more interesting villain than the Joker is. I'm pretty sure you may be familiar by now with the discussion around how Batman is ostensibly a superhero but lacks any actual superpower. And then quickly the played out joke of money being his superpower. But I dare say I have discovered Batman's superpower. And Arkham City illustrated it for me. Cue the montage. Hey, target secure. Night. Batman's superpower is he's immune to concussions. And now it's time for Stefan's miscellaneous musings. Skins are cool. The skins you unlock after you finish the game are extremely cool and playing with the animated series skin and having Kevin Conroy's voice is chef's bad kiss. I'm also a big fan of the 70s blue and grey costume as well as the Dark Knight Returns one and the Batman Beyond one. Or Batman of the future where I'm from. I am only disappointed by the lack of my other favorite Batman, Adam West's Batman 66 costume. Instead we get Sinestro Corpse. Like was this that popular of a thing? Not to mention that the Arkham Universe Batman would have a thing or two to learn from Adam West's Batman, especially when it comes to sharks. D 
decrypting is boring and uninspired as shit. I simply don't understand why decryption is still in the game. It's simply a resourcing when it comes to the upgrades because there's no real challenge in it. All you do is basically move two dials until you form a ward and that's it. This should have been its own minigame, with various levels of challenge depending on the encryption level, similar to the one in Deus Ex Human Evolution. Gliding is super relaxing. In case you're really into gliding, Arkham City has a bunch of cool upgrades and abilities which will allow you to glide for very large distances. You should get accustomed to the mechanics since Zaza's quest will be timed. There are also some challenges related to it and it's generally a nice mode of transportation. The dead bodies. Are we supposed to ignore the literal mound of dead bodies here? Or the ones that are hanging here? Cause they sure as shit are not unconscious. Look, detective mode says deceased. This might be the darkest thing in the entire game. And nobody really talks about it. So now cometh the question, what maketh a video game a classic? Some would say it's subjective, some would say it depends and there's definitely something to be said about subjective classics. Which is something I talk about on this series as well. But in order for a game to be an objective classic, it has to be considered to be good over a period of time, has to be remembered as such and also it has to stand up to current day scrutiny. And I also consider that 10 years is the minimum period required for such a hindsight based judgement to take place. In this case, we're just at that point. Batman Arkham City did even better than its predecessor, both critically and financially. It will turn out to be the second of a series of four main titles and while the series hasn't seen a new title since 2015, the upcoming Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League game looks to be at the very least a sort of spiritual successor to the Arkham series, if not an actual part of it. And I have to say, much like its predecessor, Batman Arkham City has all the makings of an objective classic. If you enjoyed this video, then by all means do me a gigantic bad fan favor and see the algorithm by liking it and commenting on it. Checking out my Patreon would also be highly appreciated if you're in a Bruce Wayne situation to do so. I've been Steven Ansons, thank you very much for watching, have a great rest of your day and you'll see me relatively soon. Same nonsense time, same nonsense channel.